Good morning everyone, I'm Francesco Tronella and like the last year I'm in charge of the technical aspects of the award ceremony of the Enrico Anglesio Prize 2021 and its source of Alice Prize. Now it's time to start and I give stage to Dr. Roberto Zanetti, the president of Pondorera Muruni, to introduce the prize and the ceremony, if I could say. Thank you, thank you Francesco. Hello everybody and welcome to the award ceremony for the Enrico Anglesio Prize 2021. It is the 23rd edition of this prize and the second edition of the two satellite prizes, Elbo Tempia and Sharon Wheeler. The Enrico Anglesio Prize is today well known in our milieu, I believe, so it's not necessary that I go through its history and its features. At any rate, I will not repeat what Dr. Rosso and myself already reported yesterday at the special session devoted to the Enrico Glazer Prize during the last day of the uh, scientific conference of the International Association of Cancer Registry. So I will just introduce the agenda of today. First, I will introduce the representative of the two co-sponsoring organizations, Freddie Bray for the International Association of Cancer Registry, and Pietro Presti for the Fondazione Tempi. Then the floor will go to Dr. Rosso that will introduce the jury, together with Vesna Zatnik that has been a recently appointed vice chair of the jury. Then the central part of the ceremony, the competitor will be introduced. There will be a summary description of the selection process. And then we will listen 11 short presentations by the 11 best scoring candidates. Then the winner will be announced and, and congratulated. Then we will have a, a short interlude of three minutes to take a glass of water. And then in the second part, we will listen an address from Manola Bettio for the European Network Cancer Agency and a quite long part in which the newly established alumni committee will have the floor, Lydia Sacchetto and the member of the cabinet, the cabinet, Yuri Ito, Daniel Curado, Ruben Schaffar, and Diana Wicklow. And then we will have some final remarks from my side and we will declare close the ceremony. So it's my turn to introduce Freddie Bray, yes. representing the International Association of Cancer Registry. Please, Freddie, excuse me, and you have the floor. Thank you so much, Roberto. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, as executive secretary of the International Association of, of Cancer Registries, it's, it's really great to be part of this uh, Enrico Iglesias Prize. Um, very much admired how this, this, this uh, prize has really become a mainstay of all our international registry activities, both in its own right and as, as certainly part of the IACR scientific meeting that has preceded the last three days. And there was a, a short session with Roberto and Stefano yesterday, as you said, giving a taste of uh, today's proceedings. Um, just, uh, it's, it's a fantastic event. It's something that uh, really goes to the heart of what the, the IEC are and my, own, my other hat as uh, the branch head of the International Agency for Research and Cancer, really sort of building uh, expertise amongst the early career scientists. And there's, there's a fantastic uh, set of presentations and such a, a, such a large field. It really has grown as a, as, as a prize with uh, 35 applications, a, a long list of 20, a short list of, of 10, and alas, only three winners. And very pleased, as I've said before, to, to have the as part of the prize is uh, a dedication to the late and much missed Sharon Whelan of IC and ICR and IREC. So that's all the time I'm going to take up for now. Uh, back to you, Roberto Stefano. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Freddie. Thank you for the support we constantly receive from. The, the, the association and from your, your staff at, at the agency. And now the floor goes to Pietro Presti, that uh, is the central, the CEO of the Fondazione Tempia in Biella, Italy. Thank you very much, Roberto, and good morning to everybody. As managing director of the uh, head of the Tempia Foundation, for me, it's a very pleasure and a great honor to be here to represent also the association Fondo do Tempia. That, that was founded 40 years ago by Elbo Tempia, that now we recording, remember with uh, this important prize. Um, Elbo Tempia Foundation 
born, was born to cover the important areas of cancer care from prevention to palliative care, also the care, the treatment and research. Now we work day by day with the public authorities in order to improve the quality of care, the quality of life the patient, for the patient and the relatives. So for us, it's very important education. And also I know that this year, this edition had a very young people to attend it, uh, to participate. So for us, it's very important and this contributes to the, for the future. So I want to thank to all the organization and also all the candidates that represent an important hope for with their work for the future and to improve the cancer care and the cancer uh, control. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, thank you, Pietro. I hope you can stay with us till the hand and in the moment of handing on the, 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 the flow of the certificate. And now, now, yes, the floor is go to Stefano for introducing the jury. Okay. Thanks, Roberto, for the introduction. Uh, so this year, we had a very high participation with 35 uh, applicants uh, from several countries. Uh, that sets a record for the Enrico Iglesio Prize history, the highest participation. Uh, all continents were represented. Europe was the most represented continent with 21 candidates, but uh, we had also five candidates from Asia, four from Africa, two from North America, two from South America, and one from Oceania. Furthermore, low and middle income countries were present uh, with six candidates. Age wise, uh, we had candidates from very young, 22 years of age to 35, the age limit of the prize. And with 35 applicants, you can imagine how complex was the work uh, for the jury. And indeed, the jury that is essential for the running uh, of the prize is presently made up uh, of 15 members that I again, thanks for their work and dedication. Uh, they are in alphabetic order, John Aitking, Claudia Alemanni, Andrea Bordoni, Henry Comber, Stella De Sabata, Chaume Galseran, Betsy Kohler, Anne Corir, Dora Loria, Tomohiro Matsuda, Marion Pigneros, Sabine Sisling, Hans Storm, Lisbeth van Eiken, and Vesna Zadnik. For this complex task, we discussed the possibility of a further help in the management of the jury. And the Fondo Elena Moroni Executive Committee asked and obtained the availability of Vesna Znadi, director of the Slovenia Cancer Registry, to serve as vice chair. So I am happy to give the uh, floor to her that will offer a brief description about some refinements of the prize rules that we introduced uh, this year. So please, Vesna, take the floor. It's up to you. Thanks. Thank you, Stefano, so much for this kind introduction. Good morning or good evening to everyone. Uh, it was my honor participating as a jury member for the last some years, but actually uh, being a jury member is not my first involvement in the Enrico Iglesias Prize. In the early years of this competition, I have already participated as the candidate, never won the prize, but anyway, it gave me a great motivation for work in cancer registry and research in cancer epidemiology. So. Uh, Stefano, I will certainly put my, all my efforts in supporting your work as a jury vice chair in the next period. Um, so uh, you asked me to give a quick summary of the rules. Uh, for the main prize, actually nothing, uh, there is nothing new. The first prize is given as all years before to the absolute winner, the candidate with the best score. But we have this year some, um, some refinements in the both special prizes. The first one is named after Sharon Willen, and it goes traditionally to the highest in ranking among uh, candidates from the low income, low middle income, or upper low middle income countries. Uh, because of um, the great number of candidates and uh, because to make as fair selection as possible, 
From this year on, the ranking is done firstly among the low income countries, and only if there is no candidates, a new ranking is done for low middle income countries for candidates. This was actually the case this year. And the prize goes to the highest in ranking among candidates from the upper low middle income countries only if there is no candidates from low income and low middle income countries. And then for the special prize, uh, Elvo Timpia, it goes to the youngest competition, but given the high number of competitions, an extra distribution criterion has been defined, and the winner must be identified with the top uh, 30, the top fertile uh, ranking of candidates. And for the first 10 in total ranking, plus for the special prize winner, uh, we invite them to present themselves at the award ceremony when this is uh, in um, taking place virtually as this year. So, Stefano, back to you. Okay, thanks, Vesna. Um, now is the time uh, to give room uh, to our candidates. Please, Roberto, it's up to you. The candidates are the essence of the prize, and has already been said, their number was exceptionally high this year with 35. I will shortly introduce them one by one. Uh, Lan An from China, Laura Botta from Italy, Nina Brick from Slovenia, Florentino Luciano Caetano dos Santos from Poland, Giulia Capitoli from Italy, Carlotta Carboni from France, then Gladys Chesumbai, that was already a competitor in the past, she's from, uh, from Kenya, Elinde Hewes from Netherlands, Dominique de Gell from Netherlands, Anouk Eichelboom, again from Netherlands, then Snila Mary George from India, Andrea Gini from France, Wen Kiang He, the only candidate from Oceania, Kian Kiari from Tunisia, Sara Korat, a second competitor from Slovenia, Jane Liang from the United States, Raquel Lopez from Spain, Alessandra Maciotta from Italy, Rim Malek, the second competitor from Tunisia and already a finalist in the edition of last year, John Matutat from, from Germany, Joyce Meijer from Netherlands, she is the youngest competitor in this edition and may be the youngest competitor in the history of the prize. We have to check the, the old files, so congratulations. Arturo Moncada Torres from Netherlands, Samantha Moraes from Portugal, she was already a finalist last year. Mejak Mantake from Tanzania, the only competitor from Sub-Saharan Africa. Marie Kepape from Netherlands, already a competitor last year and a finalist last year. Luis Gabriel Paralara from Colombia, Nelson Portilla from Colombia again, the second Colombian, Sampal Sanchetti from India, Krijam Satis Kumar from India again, Jonathan Simkin from Canada, Eldis Slotman from Netherlands, Patubrat Ripam from India, Lisa van Oostraten from Netherlands, Marissa van Maren from Netherlands, and last Federica Zamagni from Italy. Congratulations of, of all these competitors and we will see what has been their journey to the selection of the prize by the voice of the president of the jury. Please, Stefan. From the 35 candidates that send their application, few did not send their dissertation within the deadline. And the dissertation is the first step of the Every Congressio is in its virtual format, introduced last year. Uh, it consists of a summary of the present study of 1,000 words, but with references, tables, figures in addition. So it is something between a long summary and a true paper. Uh, in this first step, uh, a few other candidates did not comply with the formal rules of the prize, in particular being the first author presenter of the paper where co-authorship for the first day name does not apply here, neither for the Enrico Iglesias prize nor for the special prize. This has to be stressed. 
Then 32 dissertations were considered valid and evaluated by our pool of jury. Evaluation means a complex system of weighted scores that include the several dimensions such as originality of the study, its relevance for the field, adequacy of used methods and form and coherence. In this step also curriculum is evaluated but take into account the period of activity of the candidates in years. So the finalist, after dissertation evaluation, according to the distribution of the overall scores given by the jury, 20 candidates were selected as finalists for the second step of the competition, the video presentation. Uh, videos were evaluated according to candidates' ability to communicate the relevant message, use of iconography, and respect of the time constraints. Here again, a weighted system of scores allows to come up with an evaluation of the presented video. The final scores for the prizes, it then determined with the simple sum of scores from dissertation and the video, including candidate's curriculum as well. So we are coming to the point. According to the final scores, we would like to introduce and uh, give the floor for a brief presentation uh, of the 11 finalists with the highest overall scores among the three winners that were identified. So uh, among them, there are the three winners. Then rigorously in alphabetic order, Nika Brick from Slovenia, who presented a platform for studying the effect of COVID-19 pandemic or cancer. So please, Nika, it's up to you. Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I will try to briefly explain how the Slovenian Cancer Registry uh, tackled the task of figuring out uh, the effect of COVID-19 uh, on the cancer burden and care in Slovenia. All the data which we gathered and analyzed uh, for this purpose is published on a platform called OnCOVID, uh, which was the focus of my presentation. Uh, for OnCOVID, we used uh, data on cancer incidents, uh, referrals to examinations, and performed examinations and scans. Um, for context, uh, the COVID-19 epidemic in Slovenia followed a similar pattern uh, as most other European countries. Uh, except our first lockdown was much more severe. Uh, oncology mostly continued as normal, except for all three cancer screening programs, uh, which were temporarily uh, stopped in the first lockdown. Uh, in this analysis, we compared 2020 and 2021 data with 2019. Uh, we found that the most substantial decrease uh, in overall incidence, uh, around 30%, occurred in April of 2020. Uh, which correlates with the first lockdown uh, and a pause in non-essential services. Uh, some specific cancer sites uh, had a drop of almost 50%. Um, these reports allow the Slovenian Cancer Registry to inform decision makers about uh, short-term impact of COVID-19 control measures. Uh, the registry is, of course, also monitoring uh, for any long-term changes in cancer burden. Um, I would like to thank Fondolina Moroni for the opportunity to present my work uh, and also to everyone at the Slovenian Cancer Registry. Uh, and of course, uh, thank you all for listening. Thanks, Nika. And now I give the floor to Anuk Eichel Boom from the Netherlands, who studied the effect of the pandemic on breast cancer care. Please, Anuk. Uh, so thank you for uh, inviting me and I'm very pleased to be uh, one of the 11 finalists. So uh, the research I submitted for the Enrico Anglesio Prize is about the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on the breast cancer treatment. And we compared the treatment uh, of patients di breast cancer patients diagnosed in 2020 with the treatment of patients diagnosed in 2018, 2019. And we found that patients diagnosed in weeks 9 to 12 of 2020 had a, a lower risk of receiving new advanced chemotherapy, probably because chemotherapy was thought to increase the COVID-19 related complaints. 
In addition, we saw that patients diagnosed in weeks 18 to 26 had a higher risk of receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy, probably because of the publication of study results showing no association between chemotherapy and mortality in COVID-19 patients. Furthermore, we showed that patients diagnosed in weeks 9 to 17 had a higher risk of receiving neoadjuvant endocrine therapy, which is probably used to delay surgery. Uh, furthermore, uh, patients diagnosed in weeks 18 to 26 and we received a mastectomy had a higher risk of receiving uh, direct breast reconstruction with autologous tissue, probably because less breast cancer patients were diagnosed and because the non-vital surgeries were delayed. Uh, allowing more time to plan those difficult uh, direct risk reconstructions. And finally, we showed that patients uh, diagnosed in weeks 9 to 12 had a higher risk of receiving adjuvant chemotherapy, and those patients were also the patients who had a lower risk of receiving new adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, we also looked at the time till different uh, parts of the treatment plan. So we showed that patients diagnosed uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic had a shorter time between diagnosis and operation, operation adjuvant treatment, and between uh, neoadjuvant treatment and uh, operation. So those were in short the results of our study uh, and enjoy the rest of uh, the prize ceremony. Thank you, Anouk. And now it's time to give floor to Andrea Gini, who is an Italian working in uh, Lyon, the agency presented a work on estimated childhood cancer prevalence. Andrea, it's up to you. Thank you, Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a very a, a great pleasure for me to be here in, the, in this ceremony and uh, to be selected among the final uh, 11 uh, finalists. And I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to show my results at the ICR and to compete with the, for the uh, Enrico Anglesio Prize. My research is currently focusing on assessing childhood cancer prevalence in Europe and to assess and investigate the risk of developing a second tumor among the population of childhood cancer survivors. In the study that I submitted for the prize, uh, I aim to develop and validate a modeling method to estimate the childhood cancer prevalence using only aggregate data. And this aspect is quite innovative considering the current situation um, the legal situation in Europe in which the GDPR is limiting the data sharing, and this might impact the larger international collaborative studies that are essential for investigating rare diseases like uh, uh, cancer in children. Uh, in the study that I uh, submitted, um, we developed uh, a Markov model framework, and uh, we validate the results of this method with the existing methods for computing uh, childhood cancer prevalence, uh, that are relying on individual cancer records like the counting method, the software search that. Uh, our model produced very promising results uh, with accurate estimates. Uh, we tested this with the data of the Netherlands and uh, we compare our results with the results of search that. However, the, we need further tests to uh, determine the robustness of our estimates. So future tests need, are needed for our model, but the results are quite promising. And these are very important, especially for uh, international collaborative studies. Thank you again for this opportunity and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andrea. And now is the turn of Rim Malek from Tunisia, who studied the burden of excessive body weight on cancer. Please, Rim. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So I'm a specialist in preventive medicine from Tunisia. I have worked at the Salah Zayez Institute, Cancer Institute, at the epidemiology department uh, with a team supervised uh, by Professor Mohamed Asairi. Uh, the department works on the North Tunisia Cancer Registry. We also work on estimating the national burden of cancer attributable to modifiable risk factors, namely excess body weight which was the aim of my presentation at the Enrico Inglesio Prize Contest. We used incidence, mortality, and disability-adjusted life years estimations from the Global Burden of Disease Study in 2019. Excess body weight prevalence from the Tunisian Health Examination Survey conducted in 2016, and relative risk estimates for 14 associated cancer sites. We estimated the proportion of cancer cases, cancer-related deaths, and disability-adjusted life years attributable to excess body weight at 4% each, 
and cite specific population attributable fractions reached 10 to 36 percent for uh, certain uh, uh, associated cancer sites, uh, mainly endometrial cancer and esophageal adenocarcinoma. Postmenopausal mm -hmm. breast and endometrial cancer in women and mouth, larynx, and pharynx cancer in men were the highest contributors to excess body weight related incidence and mortality in Tunisia. Uh, and colorectal, liver, gallbladder, and pancreatic cancers generated the highest attributable disability adjusted life years. PAFs were higher in women and approached PAFs in high income countries overall and for several cancer sites. And therefore our study highlighted the, the potential impact of preventive interventions to halt or, or reverse uh, the rising obesity trends on the subsequent cancer burden. And it is my pleasure today to meet the world uh, cancer epidemiologists community and learn from your work and experience. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Now is the time to give floor to Samantha Moraes from Portugal, where she studied third primary cancer after breast cancer. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to be a finalist once again this year. It is a great honor. Um, and so the work that I submitted um, to the prize this year was conducted at the Institute of Public Health of the University of Porto. And we estimated the long-term risk and survival of third primary cancers among females with a first primary breast cancer in Northern Portugal, using data from the North Region Cancer Registry. So we considered uh, first primary breast cancers diagnosed between 2000 and 2010, and we followed these patients to the end of 2015 for the occurrence of subsequent primary cancers, and then to the end of June of 2021 for all-cause mortality. So through this work, we found that the most common third primary cancer sites were digestive, breast, and female genital organs. And we estimated a 15-year cumulative incidence of 0.69% among uh, first primary breast cancers. Finally, um, as expected, patients with a third primary uh, cancer had a worse long-term survival compared to patients with a second primary cancer only. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. And now it's time to call uh, Marieke Papi from the Netherlands, who presented a study on treatment partners of esophageal and junctional cancers. Good afternoon. Uh, I will briefly describe the study I, I uh, submitted for the prize this year. Uh, we performed a nationwide uh, population-based uh, cohort study to investigate recurrence patterns, uh, post-recurrent survival and post-recurrent treatment in patients with esophageal or gastroesophageal junction cancer. And herefore, we used uh, data from the Netherlands Cancer Registry and uh, follow-up data on disease recurrence was collected for patients with a primary uh, non-metastatic diagnosis in 2015 and 2016 and who received uh, treatment with curative intent. And uh, from this population, we found uh, of the patients who had a recurrence, around 20% of patients presented with local regional recurrence only, and 80% of patients presented with distant recurrence or combined local regional and distant recurrence. And a medium time from treatment after primary diagnosis to disease recurrence was shorter in patients uh, who had distant recurrence or combined local regional and distant recurrence compared to patients with local regional recurrence only. And post-recurrence treatment patterns also differed between these three groups um, in which patients with local regional recurrence more often received chemoradiotherapy and less often received systemic therapy compared to the other two groups. And, um, and around 60% of all patients received best supportive care only. The post-recurrent survival of all patients was poor. Uh, so for survival of patients with local regional recurrence was eight months, of distant recurrence, four months, and of patients who had uh, combined local regional and distant recurrence, survival was three months. And if we looked at uh, subpopulations of patients who received a specific type of treatment, we found that patients with local regional recurrence who received radical treatment, survival was 18 months compared to 
pay to six months in patients receiving best supportive care only. To conclude, uh, in our study showed that the majority of patients presented with distant recurrence for whom prognosis was particularly poor. And more than half of all patients received best supportive care only, also indicating the need for novel treatments for patients with a poor performance status. And in addition, there's also the need to identify better patients who could be eligible for receiving radical treatment as this subpopulation had the highest survival advantage. I wanna thank you for the, this opportunity to present uh, my work. Thanks. Great, Marieke. Now it's time to present uh, Nelson Portilla from Colombia with a machine for extracting information from pathology records. Please, Nelson. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank the Fondo Elena Moroni for Oncology for the opportunity to participate in this prize and thank to the jury for having selected me as a finalist. I'm working at the Cali Cancer Registry that has operated continuously since 1962 and has incidence data for the past 60 years. That has been published in, in the 11 volumes of cancer incidents in five continents. Its methodology has spread it for to four cancer registry in Colombia, a low to middle income country. The project that I'm presenting has four critic phases. The first was the transformation from an structured data that the cancer registry received in a massive way to a structured data that was distributed in, in databases. The second was the creation of the gold standard. It took more than six months for the manual review of the 250,000 pathology reports by the Cali Cancer Registry team. The third was the extraction of cancer concepts using the UMLS guidelines with the Spanish model and the evaluation of negation in sentences. The last phase was the use of data mining techniques with machine learning, we developed a classification model that predicts with high rate of sensibility and specificity uh, whether a pathology report has the presence or absence of cancer. Finally, we have improved the time and cost of data processing in the Cali Cancer Registry. I'm still working on improving this project and hope it can be applied to other cancer registries in Latin America. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson. And now, uh, the stage is for Jonathan Sinking from Canada, who presented a cancer incident analysis in small geographical areas in British Columbia. Jonathan. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, allowing me to participate and everyone who's joined in on this nice uh, conference here and, and uh, meeting. Um, so it's my pleasure to have presented our work in small area disease mapping uh, of cancer incidents using data from the BC Cancer Registry. Um, I'm from Canada, so Green is from Canada. I work at the BC Cancer Registry as a scientific director, um, and I'm at the U University of British Columbia as a PhD candidate, and my area uh, is to look at um, small area disease mapping. Uh, it's something that has a long history in population oncology, uh, at least disease mapping, uh, geographical analyses often uh, are based, though, on relatively broad geographic areas. And while this is really useful for high-level surveillance and health planning, small area analyses present new opportunities to understand local disease patterns. The desire for small area analyses has been long-standing. However, several barriers do remain uh, for widespread adoption, and this includes technically sophisticated methods and unstable risk estimates for small populations. Additionally, people and communities are often clustered geographically, which, have, which ha may have important influences on disease rates. So when data are clustered, traditional statistical methods that rely on independent observations are not necessarily appropriate. So for this study, uh, we used uh, PC cancer registry data and we demonstrate an analytic approach to examine lung cancer risk at a small area level using Bayesian hierarchical modeling. Uh, and, a technically, and we developed a technically accessible tool um, to called the small area map, and we developed this in, in R. Uh, and so we built an R package for folks to download, use, and to 
be able to uh, carry out our analytic approach uh, and produce, um, you know, beautiful uh, visual summaries of, of disease risk and estimate small area disease risk. Ultimately, what we found were pretty strong geographic patterns uh, in uh, BC, nearly one fifth of 218 small areas showed elevated risk. And uh, going to the literature, this is likely related to differences in regional tobacco smoking, um, socioeconomic status, radon exposure, air pollution, and, and other risk factors. Um, our analytic tool, we drew on methodological advances and best practices to estimate risk at small areas. And ultimately, we, we developed a tool in, in R and specifically used a Shiny application, which is a, um, an interactive platform for uh, computation and, um, and analysis. Uh, so um, the, the package is publicly available. It's called Small Area Map, if anyone's interested, and you can download it. Uh, I'd be happy to hear feedback as well. And it's open source, so you can take the code and run with it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. And now I introduce Lisa von Hogestraten from the Netherlands to study the impact of a pandemic on bladder cancer. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, our work here. And I'm very honored to be one of the finalists uh, for the prize. So um, when COVID came to the Netherlands, uh, this largely disrupted regular healthcare, but the exact impact on bladder cancer care was uh, largely unknown. So therefore we evaluated the impact of COVID on the number of diagnoses of bladder cancer, treatment, time to treatment and surgical capacity. And we did this by using data from the Netherlands Cancer Registry and we compared data from 2020 to data from 2018 and 2019. And we had a special focus on the period of March to May of 2020, because this uh, comprised the first COVID wave in the Netherlands. Um, what we observed was, especially during the first COVID wave, uh, a large decrease in diagnosis uh, of as much as 14%. Um, but later on, the number of diagnoses uh, increased again to pre-COVID levels. And regarding treatment, we observed only little changes, uh, luckily. And these changes were also only temporary. For example, uh, less patients receive new adjuvant chemotherapy. And this is mostly in agreement with the adapted guidelines that were published in order to ensure uh, continuity of oncological care. Um, and we also observed some small changes in time to treatment. Uh, for example, time to radical cystectomy, which is a whole bladder removal, uh, became shorter during the COVID period. Uh, and time to new adjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy became longer. And this is again in agreement with the adapted guidelines that were published. And regarding surgical capacity, we evaluated this by um, counting all the number of radical cystectomies uh, performed in 2020, and again, comparing it to previous years. And surprisingly, we observed that during the first COVID wave, the number of cystectomies increased quite strongly, um, but later on, the number decreased. So in conclusion, um, it appears that the first COVID wave has limited impact on bladder cancer care in the Netherlands. Um, we observed a decrease in diagnosis, some small changes in treatment, um, and surgical capacity was not affected during the first wave. However, we think that the delayed diagnosis might um, cause a state shift, which might later on impact recurrence and uh, progression and survival rate and uh, rates. And this may be evaluated in the future. So again, uh, thank you all for your attention and for the opportunity to present here. With the next uh, candidates, uh, finalists actually, we stay in the Netherlands and I introduce Marisa van Maren. Uh, she investigated the effect of a socioeconomic status in young breast cancer patients. Ms. Marisa. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction and also thank you for uh, making me one of the finalists. Um, so in our research, we uh, analyzed the associations between socioeconomic status, recurrence and excess mortality in young breast cancer patients. And we focused on the young breast cancer patients because earlier studies showed that socioeconomic differences were most pronounced in these young patients. And besides uh, young age defined as age under 40 years is an independent prognostic factor for breast cancer survival. So this makes it also a very interesting group to study. So we included over 500 patients from the Netherlands Cancer Registry, which is a very nicely represented registry here. Um, and our registration clerks collected data on uh, all recurrences that occurred within 10 years from date of last surgery. 
And what we found was that for patients of low social class, that they not only had a higher risk of recurrence, but also had much more consecutive recurrences compared to patients of high social class. And also that they had a much shorter time span between surgery and development of first recurrence and between development of a recurrence and death. So uh, having a poor prognosis. In a joint modeling analysis in which we took into account the correlation between recurrence and excess mortality. After correction for confounding, we found that there was still a significant association between socioeconomic status and recurrence, and that recurrence was largely positively associated with excess mortality, which is, of course, as we expected. And what we show here is that in this specific patient group, so in these young patients, that socioeconomic differences are largely related to the recurrence pattern rather than other factors, for example, comorbidity and lifestyle that may affect mortality. And of course, in these young patients, comorbidity is not likely to play a role. So we provide uh, clear leads for future research, which should focus on the on the recurrences, so treatment of recurrence, but also the time intervals, treatment adherence. It may be that patients of low social class may have uh, lower therapy adherence than patients of high social class, um, and to look into uh, decision making. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marisa. And now, uh, time to give the floor to the last finalist, last man on the list, and this is just an alphabetic order. And the last finalist is Federica Zamagni from Italy with an analysis of the interplay of lesion thickness and improved treatment on melanoma survival. Please, Federica. First of all, thank you for having selected me as a finalist and for organizing this uh, virtual ceremony. The presented study is aimed at determining the relative contribution of decreasing tumor thickness to the upward trend in survival from cutaneous malignant melanoma in Italy in the last years. Um, after the World War II, there was an increase in the incidence of cutaneous malignant melanoma in many Western countries, mainly driven by early stage melanoma, also defined as thin. A parallel increase in survival has been observed. It is generally attributed to the rise in thin lesions incidence rates, given that thickness is an important prognostic factor for survival from melanoma. We considered a 15-year study period from 2003 to 2017. We observed an increase in survival for males and females, particularly at the end of the study period, males achieved the same survival levels as females, while maintaining a higher tumor thickness. Furthermore, we observed a steeper increase in survival in males with thicker melanoma from uh, 2013 onwards. Um, we uh, then observed that, especially for men, the decrease in tumor thickness accounted for a lesser part of the improvement in survival observed in the study period. The introduction of uh, targeted therapies and uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in 2013 is uh, the most likely factor to account for the remaining component. In fact, uh, ipilimumab and uh, venurafenib have been approved by the Italian Drug Agency precisely in the first half of 2013. Moreover, the survival disadvantage of men is most, most likely due to less resistance to progression than to greater aggressiveness of melanoma. Consequently, they have a larger benefit from novel therapies. Um, I have finished my presentation. Thank you all for the attention and for giving me the opportunity to participate in this prize. Thank you, Federica. And now is the time to announce the winner. But before doing that, uh, I would like to ask the, all the finalists to turn the camera on uh, and the audio on so they uh, we can see the reaction of the of the winners. This should be okay. Let me check. Everybody's there. So, after so much expectation, 
the winner of the Enrico Anglesio Prize virtual edition of the year 2021 is Marisa Corinne Van Mare. Hi, Marisa. Are you happy? <laughs> Yes, I'm very happy. I didn't expect this, and especially not after seeing all the nice pictures of all the other contestants. So, yes, I'm very happy. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, then, and uh, now uh, I will tell you the winner of the Enrico Anglesio of the uh, El Votempia. The El, El Votempia special prize. That is given to the youngest uh, uh, finalist in the first highest third time. So it's a distribution uh, criteria and uh, uh, criteria on age. So it's the, uh, the youngest between the best and the winner of the Votempia Special Prize 2021 is Federica Zamani. He was the youngest uh, with the highest score. Federica. Thank you. I'm uh, very surprised. Um, I'm very happy also. Thank you. The Sharon Willam special prize is given to the highest score within the low uh, middle income countries. And as Vesna has explained you, uh, we privilege the low income country. And then if there are nobody in the low income country, we go to the middle income and the upper middle. But this year we have yeah. candidates from all the, uh, the different uh, classification of the low and middle income country. So the winner of the Sharon Willem Special Prize 2021 is Rimalek. Thank you, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm very pleased with, uh, and very grateful. Uh, and it was not really expected, but uh, the credit also goes to uh, uh, my colleagues and uh, uh, and also for my supervisor, Professor Hsari, uh, my colleague which, uh, who is present here, Dr. Huyem Khiari, and uh, all the team at Sarah uh, Hadeh's Institute. And that really encouraged me to work further on cancer epidemiology and cancer registration, which has many uh, insufficiencies, let's say, in Tunisia. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Congratulations again to all the three of you. And we have also a diploma. <laughs> To give yeah. you now is the, the moment of the certificates. Huh? So I I, I I have the pleasure to hand over the certificate, this one to the winner, the absolute winner of the contest, that is the winner of the Enrico Glacier Prize, that is Marisa Corinne Van Maar. Huh? You should receive this certificate by mail in the next minutes, we hope. And next week, you will also receive the monetary amount of the prize. Congratulations, Mrs. Balmaga. Yes, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you very much all. And also, I congratulate all the other contestants because they did a great job, as I could see uh, from the pitches. Good. And now the floor to... Um, Mr. Pietro Presti, Pietro, to hand over the certificate for the El Votempia Special Prize. Thank you very much, Robert. Roberto, I ask to the IT manager if I can share the digital certificate, if I can share with the, since I don't have the paper, but I want to try the digital certificate. This is a virtual. Can you see it? So perfect. This is a very virtual handover. So congratulations, Federica, for your work, the increase in fitness and nurse therapy have both contributed to the 2020s increase in survival from melanoma in Italy. So very congratulations. It's an honor to be for me to represent Tempia Foundation, in this case, Elvo Tempia Special Prize. Thank you. 
Thank you, Pietro. And now the floor goes to Joanne Eitken for handing over the, the certificate <clears throat> for Rim Malek, the winner of the Seven Wheeler Special Prize. Should I, um, Dr. Eitken, should I share two or you have yours? Well, I do have um, <laughs> one, but I'm sure that it would be much better to have the um, electronic real version. So if you would like to do that, then by all means. Congratulations, Rim. Thank um, you very here. much, Ms. Eitken. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful to the fund and uh, all the uh, partners. Uh, and uh, hopefully, <laughs> maybe I will participate again in the next year. Very Thank well, you so much uh, for all the finalists too. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, also uh, nice uh, to to hear their experience and uh, to learn more about the uh, big world of cancer epidemiology. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Okay. Congratulations to all the competitors, the finalists and winners. And according to the agenda, we have now a very short interlude, a very short poll of three minutes. So see you again in three minutes. Okay. We can resume the meeting with the last part of the agenda. And it is my pleasure to give the floor to Manola Betillo, the representative of the European Network Cancer Registries. The European Network Cancer Registries helped a lot this edition, disseminating the announcement and encouraging in various ways its young membership to compete in Enrico Iglesio and satellite prize contest. Please, Manola, you have the floor. Thank you, Roberto. And good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I am Manola Bettio. I work at the European Commission, and uh, I am coordinating the group behind the European Cancer Information System, which I hope all the participants know, which is basically the platform hosting and processing um, data on the cancer burden for Europe. Uh, we are closely working with the, the network of cancer registries, the European one, the ENCR, of which we have also representative in, at this meeting. And uh, I'm very grateful for the invitation to join this uh, ceremony. And uh, I, I found very interesting and nice presentations on topics which we are also working on. Uh, and I could really flavor the enthusiasm from the, the competitors to the prize. So congratulations and very promising research topics and research carried out. I'm very happy that we could uh, also promote participation to, to the prize and we could have a role in this uh, among the European audience. And actually uh, I'm very happy uh, when comparing the names of the people having also um, uh, having a role in the in, uh, forthcoming ENCR conference. I'm happy to see that uh, there were and there are five people that also contribute, will contribute to the ENCR conference. And actually, I take the opportunity to promote this event. And if I'm allowed to share the screen, I'm trying to. Okay, good. Okay, so I was just saying that the meeting will be over three days, half days. There are six scientific sessions 
with nearly 30 contribution, oral contributions, plus uh, something like 55 posters. On the first day, there will be a welcome session by uh, the director, uh, John Ryan, uh, from the European Commission, DG Sante, and the two scientific sessions on the first day will be around the COVID-19 pandemic and cancer registration, and uh, heard today uh, nice speeches also on this topic. Uh, on the second day, we will have uh, IARC's director introducing with a keynote lecture. And then we have two sessions, one on the estimation of cancer burden, so more from the statistical side. And the second session uh, focused on stage and treatment data and analysis, of course. And the third day, we have uh, the keynote speaker, Joseph Borras from the University of Barcelona, that will uh, talk about cancer control and the connection with uh, cancer registry data. There will be a session on cancer control and the last session on comorbidities and cancer inequalities. On the three days, we will also have poster sessions. We have around uh, 55, something like that, posters. And I'm very happy to see that also um, the winner of the Elvio Tempias Prize, uh, Federica Zamagni, uh, has a poster uh, at the, the conference. So uh, this is it. So once more, I'm very happy of the uh, collaboration that we were able to establish with um, the colleagues from IARC and IACR meeting, which we are always uh, very well uh, working with, and also with Roberto and uh, all the, uh, the EAP prize, which again, uh, congratulations uh, to the participants and to the winners as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manola. And now we go to the last part of on the agenda of today, listening Lydia and the other members of the cabinet of the Enrico Anglesio Prize Alumni Committee, Robin Schaffar, um, Daniel Jurado, Yuri Hito, and Diana Wito, that will tell us what this committee is and what it will do during the future. Lydia, please, you have the floor. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this final part of this ceremony. And thank you for remaining connected till now, even if for some of you it's already some, a Friday night. You may think that the most thrilling part of this event is already over. And indeed, nothing can compete with the suspense and enthusiasm and excitement of the winner reveal. But we will still have a terrific announcement small surprise and worldwide live contribution before, before the closure of the ceremony. Firstly, we are happy and proud to, to announce that the idea of the Enrico Anglesio Prize Alumni Committee, firstly presented at our virtual event last year, turned into reality. And the committee has been officially established at the beginning of the summer. And it now counts around 170 members. The committee aims to develop a dynamic network of relationship between winners, participants, and friends of the Enrico Anglesio Prize, and to connect young researchers all over the world to share knowledge, experience, to follow careers development, and to celebrate success, remaining committed to its vision, connect, engage, succeed, and celebrate summarized by the motto Carpe Diem in Scientium. The membership is voluntary, inclusive and free of charge with automatic joining on application for the contest. Individual young researchers from fields different from cancer can also be invited to join and to contribute the scientific interchange. The committee can appoint honorary members who are eminent researcher and distinguished people who contributed to cancer control, 
to the Enrico Inglese Prize and or to the Alumni Committee Activities and Duties. This honorary member will act as advisors and mentors. The Alumni Committee has a dedicated web page on the Fondo Elena Moroni website, where one can find the detailed terms of, of reference, the complete list of the members update as per today, and where all the news related to the committee are posted. In addition, each alumnus can gain visibility, populating its personal page with a picture, the contact information, and a short bio sketch. We provided the layout and first draft of this page, but in future, we are planning to allow the members to modify and update the page by themselves. This is still a work in progress, and I would like to thank all the members who have already provided this information and to encourage the others to submit uh, the information, the picture and the bioscape via the alumni email box, uh, as you can find the address here in the slide. This personal page should become a kind of talent windows where you have the possibility to show yourself and shine. And of course, we will be more than happy to see this personal page linked in your social media. The alumni committee is overseen by a cabinet formed by three prefecti, the elect, the incumbent and the past, and an ancillus or ancilla. And these, three, these four people are elected among the members, plus a liaison officer appointed by the Fondo Elena Moroni. The cabinet coordinates the activities of the committee, fostering proposals from other members and taking care of the organization of the meetings. Even if the liaison officer will help if needed, we strongly believe it is important that the committee will define his identity by itself, so don't be shy and get in touch. However, for the initial round of activity of the Enrico Inglesio Prize Alumni Committee, essentially for this year and next year, an election would have been premature, and therefore the Fondo Elena Moroni in the last week identified some enthusiastic alumni to serve in the cabinet with similar role and responsibilities. They are in alphabetic order, Yuri Ito from Japan, Daniel Jurado from Colombia, Robin Schaffar from Switzerland, Diana Wittrow from UK and former US, and myself from Italy as liaison officer. Yuri, Daniel, Robin, and Diana eagerly accepted our invitation. Thank you so much. And I'm really happy to have some of them today with us. In a few minutes, I will let the stage to them to hear their voice. But let me before introduce the one who cannot join due to previous commitment. Robin, Shafar is the winner of the 2014 Grail edition of the Enrico Inglese Prize. He has a master in public health from the University Claude Bernard in Lyon, France, and a PhD in epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He is now a senior research associate at the Geneva Cancer Registry and University of Geneva in Switzerland. Robin share with us this nice picture and funny memory. My first participation dates back to 2009. And for many years, I have been told I was too young to get the prize, but it was a great opportunity to meet other young researchers. In 2014, I was finally old enough to be awarded. Welcome on board, Robin. And now it's time to give the stage to Diana Witro to present and introduce herself. Hello everyone, thanks for having me today. Um, it's my pleasure to be here again this year in the second virtual ceremony. Um, I also participated in 2014, although it seems we were in different places for those photos, Robin and I. I was in Ottawa and uh, also was a, a finalist and reapplied in 2020. Um, I've been consistently impressed by the community and the enthusiasm of the, of the jurors and those who run the prize. And uh, 
their enthusiasm rubbed off on me. So I'm really happy to be participating in this capacity. Um, and I'm looking forward to meeting all of you in the coming months and years. Thank you very much, Diana, and welcome on board. And now it's the time to give the floor to Yuri Ito. Thank you. Um, hi, um, I'm Yuri, and it is great honor to join the cabinet of the Enrico alumni. I'm a winner of the uh, prize of IECL 2010 meeting, which was held in Yokohama in Japan. And it's already over 10 years ago. And after the prize, I worked a lot about the study for cancer control in Japan, and especially focused on the socioeconomic inequalities and cancer outcome. And recently published these two books related to the topic. And I'm working as an associate professor in a medical school. My role is teaching statistics and supporting medical research for students and faculty in the university. And in addition, I'm focusing on training future generation of young researchers of descriptive epidemiology uh, using population-based cancer registry data in Japan because the number of researchers in this area is very small in Japan. And about the memories of uh, the prize, I still remember I was uh, very nervous at the presentation and uh, Freddie asked very difficult question and I couldn't answer very well. So I was very surprised to be a, a prize winner. The, this prize gave me a great confidence and uh, encouraged my research motivation. And I'm really appreciating this uh, great experience. I'm excited to work as a member of the cabinet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuri, and welcome on board. And now, finally, Daniel, it's your time to present. Thank you for this invitation. It's a great honor to be here. My name is Daniel Pirado. I am an epidemiologist from Pasco City, which is located at the city of Colombia. I have more than 10 years of professional experience in cancer research, working at the Cancer Registry of Pasco, which is at the Center for Health Studies of the Learning University where I also work as a research professor in several programs such as medicine and other health programs. I have received uh, training by IAC and other universities and agencies at all, which are the government School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in England, uh, the Union University in Germany, the International Union for Cancer Control, the National Institute of Health, and the National Cancer Institute from the United States, and GREL, of course, uh, since 2018, I have been an official IR training for Colombia and Latin America. Um, I also have been part um, of the network that holds the 50, 50 world leaders in cancer research, the IR 50, 50 program. I have also published several scientific papers in international journals such as National Cancer Epidemiology, as well in national journals in Colombia. In 2016, with the team of Cancer Registry, we developed a world entitled Exploring Social Cultural Pathways for Cervical Cancer Survival in Low and Middle Income Setting. The goal of this work was to establish the mechanism, I mean, the, the pathway of influence of in socioeconomic condition on cervical cancer outcomes. For this work, I received the Inter Congress of Prize Award during the Great Meeting in Albi, France. After uh, that's what this world uh, was dead and great, including a model for West Cancer and presented at the World Cancer Congress in Paris and the ICGEG meeting in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, right now, we hope to increase this project using data of all cancer registry in Colombia and to publish this research in, in the near future. Okay, this is a brief description uh, of the work related to the English medicine lesson that I have been part. And thank you uh, for letting me be part of the particular English alumni committee cabinet. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel, and welcome on board. And for those who do not know me yet, I won the IACR edition of the Enrico Anglesio Prize in 2016 in Marrakesh. After a number of attempts, I have to admit, I show also by others 
one should not be afraid of this courage from failure because it's really difficult to be successful the first time. It's a really high competitive contest. I have a master degree in math from the University of Torino, Italy, and a PhD in pure and applied math from the Politecnico di Torino. At present, I work as a genomic and biomarker statistician in the Oncology Strategic Unit of Bayer Pharmaceutical in Berlin, Germany. But before I worked for many years as an epidemiologist at the Piedmont Cancer Registry, and I'm happy to continue to have connection with the Cancer Registry world. And now, the small surprise has promised. The Fondo Elena Moroni granted to the Enrico Anglese Prize Alumni Committee an initial budget up to 1,000 euros for initiative and activity in line with the mission and vision of the committee. We have already some ideas, but we are looking forward to receiving your proposals. There is no deadline, nor strict rules for the application to follow. Just be creative and innovative and send us a detailed and clear explanation of what you think could be the best way to use these funds to make the alumni committee to shine, to increase visibility, and to foster interchange and relationship. We, are, we wanted you, and we are waiting for your ideas. Thank you. And now I will let the floor to Dr. Zanetti for the closure of the ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia, and thank you to all the members of the cabinet for their engagement, and, and I hope they will also stimulate the other alumni to be active in, in future. This, this, this committee is a new board, it's just has been happening for the last uh, uh, few months, and you, you can see what he's already uh, uh, proposing and, and, and working on. Well, the, the final remarks, I will be, we have been on time, we are on schedule, we have been on schedule all, all the ceremony, that is a, a, a very good thing. Uh, as final remark, I will say, I will repeat our pleasure this year to have been able to run the prize again in connection with uh, the meeting of the association. Uh, the relation with the association is extremely important for, for this prize and it testified by many by many aspects, but the fact that we have competitors coming that all around the world. Let's hope that next year, the conference of the International Association could be again in person, as it normally be. If it will, again, not possible to have completely it in person, let's hope that some, maybe a mixed model with a part in person, one part online, uh, could be organized next year. We will see. Second, I have to thank the people that made the edition of this year possible. They are in particular our staff at, 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 the, at the Enrico Anglesio, uh, at the uh, Ellen Maroni Foundation that works at the Enrico Anglesio Prize. But we have also to acknowledge the contribution, the terrific contribution that come from the Secretariat of the International Association of Cancer Agency, and in particular from Maria Schell Fernand, that since 2016, the edition in Marrakech, uh, assures the, uh, uh, an excellent cooperation between the Fondo de la Moroni and the, 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 the International Association of Cancer Agency. I have to thank our uh, uh, IT technician, uh, Francesco Petronella, of course, and looking at the future, I have, uh, I think, not, not, not true, 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 true announcement, but some idea of possible improvement of the price for, for the future, and starting with the documentation of the price of this year, we engage it with respect to the competitors to make the documents, the materials available. Uh, I confirm this orientation. We have to discuss with them to decide in which way to make available uh, uh, public domain uh, the, the material, the video, the dissertation, the material of the contest. A second and maybe more delicate point to discuss, and in particular to discuss with the alumni, through the alumni uh, committee cabinet, but in general with the audience of the alumni, is in which way in the future to communicate the specific result of the contest. 
the scoping, essentially. Yes, no, in which way? I think that all the competitors are curious, are eager to know their result. We have to find a good way to, to increase the transparency and the communication. So see you next year. Thank you to everybody. Congratulations to everybody, and in particular to all the competitors and winners, of course. Bye-bye. <laughs>